Good morning. Good to see all of your smiling faces today. Thank you for coming out and being a part of our service here at Victory Church in beautiful Chattanooga, Tennessee. It makes the service extra special that you're here. Everybody's supplying their own part. So uh, thank you for coming out and being a part of our service today. I would like to continue with uh, what we have been on for the last several weeks. Uh, we've kind of led into this actually from the Christmas story. But we've been looking at this, the book of Galatians. And we've been going through it expositorily. And I would like to continue with that this morning. Galatians is a very, very good book to help. Uh, or a good letter, to explain who we are in Christ, to help us with our identity in Christ. So I would like for you to turn with me. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, chapter 4, but before we get into chapter 4, I just I want to look back. Uh, chapter 3 is, in my opinion, one of the most powerful chapters in our Bible. It is one of the most powerful chapters as far as setting things straight on our part of the covenant, uh, uh, as far as the Gentiles' part of the covenant. Uh, it's a great dividing chapter, if you will, on uh, God's intention where the covenant was concerned with Abraham. So, if you'll recall, our jumping off verse of Scripture has actually been in chapter 2, uh, verse 20, which leads into chapter 3. And chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. This is one of, th this is a powerful verse of scripture on our identification on us identifying with jesus of how god looks at the price that jesus paid he looks at it as we are paid in full and we're in him we're in christ and uh, so like i said the whole book deals with that and, and then particularly when it leads in to chapter three uh, i want to remind you of verse 13 Verse 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone uh, who hangs on a tree. So, He has, He became that curse. He has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And then we go to verse 16. And it says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. So he's, he's, Paul is telling you the promise of this covenant was made to Abraham and his seed. And he, makes, he, he shows you particularly that he's not talking about to seeds as to many, he's talking about one person. It was made to Abraham and Abraham's seed, not talking about Isaac but talking about Jesus. So, let me ask you this question. If we're in Christ, and our identity is with Him, then was that promise made to us? Yes. And remember, the promise was, the thing that God actually said to him was, surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your seed. And when God blesses something, I mean, that is a, that's, that's a big deal. Blessing means to empower, uh, to prosper, or to uh, be empowered for success in every area of your life. Think of John 10.10. 10. Jesus has come to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. That's being blessed. Now, if you'll look with me at verse 29, which is at the end of chapter 3. And if you are Christ... This is what we were saying. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, to us today as Christians, we look at this and we think, well, that's, that's really good news. And, and of course it's that way. But I have to remind you here of who this was written to. 
This was written to Gentiles. The Galatians were Gentiles. The Galatians were not Jews. They were Celtics, remember? Gauls from uh, Middle Europe, particularly France. So they had not been raised up under the law. They didn't know the law. And that's why the Judaizers came up from Jerusalem, because they thought they needed to explain to them about the law so they could be sure and live under the law and thus fulfill the law of God and be blessed in this new movement of Christianity. Well, you can understand somebody that had never been brought up in that, and the Apostle Paul had taught them grace and had taught them the uh, uh, atonement and justification by the Lord Jesus, you can understand why this would have caused great confusion. So they were trying to put them back under the law. Now, let me share something with you. There are relatives of Judaizers around today. There are people today that still try to put us under the law. Now, there are obvious things uh, that, that, you would, that you would look at and think, well, of course that's under the law. We don't have to do that today. But there are some things that are a little more subtle that'll, that'll catch you off guard if you're not careful. Now, we're going to get into this uh, either later on today or next week when it leads into chapter 5, which is um, when the Apostle Paul really starts shucking the corn where this is concerned. But right now, Paul is making a transition. He, he, is, he is telling these Galatians, listen, this promise of eternal life was made to Abraham and his seed, that seed being Christ. And if you, Galatians are in Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, you can understand how a Jewish-minded person would have had a duck fit at that. What do you mean these are Abraham's children? And I want to remind you, Abraham was not a Jew. Okay? He was from Ur of the Chaldees from modern-day Iraq. He was not, you know, his original land was not uh, the land of promise, the land of Canaan. Matter of fact, he went from there up to uh, visit uh, uh, Uncle Haran and paid Anaram. Y'all remember that, don't you? On the other side of the uh, uh, Euphrates River. And then the Lord told him to go down into a land that I will show you. So that's when he came down into the promised land. And, and you have to understand, uh, this was quite a deal for, for Abraham. I mean, he had come from the area of what we refer to as the Fertile Crescent. I mean, it's surrounded, it's bordered by the Tigris and the Euphrates River. It is a fertile place with all, I mean, it's green. And the place that God shows Abraham to go is rocks. Bunches of rocks. It does not look, it's not quite as pretty. Now, there are pretty places. But it was not near as pretty as where Abraham had come from. So to, to keep in mind, uh, Abraham was not a Jew. They were not called Jews till later. Actually, the, 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 the term Jews came uh, talking about one specific tribe, and that would be the tribe of Judah. So Abraham is talking to the, and he said, look, if you're in Christ, then you're in the, co the covenant applies to you. And there are a lot of benefits that go with that. So he is he's addressing this letter of where the Judaizers, to put them under the law, have come in and messed up the teaching. So now chapter 4 is the transition that he uses to get into the meat in chapter 5. So in chapter 4, he, he starts explaining to them, and he uses a comparison. He talks about that there were two covenants. And so he begins to lead into that in uh, chapter 4 and verse 1. He says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. In other words, you can have an heir in a house, and as he's bring, being brought up, his rights and privileges are no different than anybody else's. It's as he gets older and grows into that is when he gets the rights and, and privileges of being born into that particular household. 
but he is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, okay, just in that same manner, even so we, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. So He said Jesus was born under the law. To redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, here again, if he'd have had Judaizers reading this letter, they'd have had a fit that he that 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 Paul was calling Galatians, Gauls, Celtics, sons of Abraham. That was a title to them that was reserved for Jews only. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, or Father. Now, here again, we just look at that and we don't see the significance of that. Here, the, the, the Jewish legal-minded people, they'd be having a fit at this too. As a matter of fact, just let me go ahead so that I don't have to say this all the time. They would be having a fit at almost everything he's going to be writing here, okay? Because the Apostle Paul's attacking what it is that they said in the premise, the very foundation of the way that they believed, which was in error. He said, because your sons, that made a mad, now then the spirit of his son is in your hearts, and it causes you to cry, Abba, or Father. And the significance of this is, uh, you know, I mean, with your own earthly dad. You refer to your dad sometimes as father. You may be talking to a group of people and say, well, my father told me to do so much, or my father taught me to do this. Now, that shows a little more reverence and respect as opposed, as opposed to my dad or my daddy. Okay? Abba, the word Abba is actually an Aramaic word that means dad or daddy. It's, it's, a, it's more a term of endearment or closeness than it is the more formal uh, word for father. So, he, in other words, he's saying, uh, you, now that you have been born into Christ, then the Spirit of His Son is in your heart, and it causes you to have that, causes you to have access to, to that close, intimate relationship with Him. Not just the relationship of our Heavenly Father that will smite you down if you step out of line, but that endearing, sweet relationship with Him. Here again, the legal people, they don't like this. They don't, they don't like this. Matter of fact, most of them didn't have that relationship either and uh, because they approached God legalistically. Verse 7, Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. That's it. They all passed out and fainted right there in the place. Bam. So, so what, what the legal people just heard was, these heathens are now sons of God. Abraham, sons of God, and they couldn't stand it. They just all passed out right there. They just they they all succumbed to the vapors or whatever. But yes, that's how powerful of a message this is. That's now to us today. We we just think this way, but this was foreign to this generation. This was new revelation to them. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are still some people that still think this way today that need this revelation. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you serve those by nature that are not gods. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, oh, that's an important phrase. Uh, now after you have known God, or rather you are known by God. Now, that's really important. It's one thing to know God or know of a God, but it's a, it's a whole uh, 
it's a whole lot more secure position to be known by God, for Him to know you. He said, that's, you know, that's a wonderful thing. How is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? So, remember, the, the Gauls and the Celtics, they didn't, they didn't worship, um, you know, it wasn't like they were going back to worshiping the God of the Old Testament or something like that. He said, you didn't even know. He said, you, you worship the beggarly elements of the earth. They worshiped the moon. They worshiped the sun. They worshiped the soil. They worshiped trees. They worshiped... So, you know, he said, you, you worship gods that you didn't even... You know, that, that had no power, that had nothing. That was what everything was based on. And instead of... Now you have been introduced to the true and living God... And you know Him, and not only do you know Him, He knows you. And, and so, why now are you, are, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements which you desire again to be in bondage? So you're, you're putting yourself back under bondage to that type of religion, that type of worship that you have come out of. You observe days and months and seasons and years, and that's what they worshipped. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Brethren, I urge, and, and now here again, I want you to notice, just some little subtle thing like this in verse 12. Brethren, he's referring to them as believers. He's not referring to them as heathen or Gentiles. He's referring to them as Fellow believers, brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. So apparently, when the Apostle Paul first came into the area, he had a physical infirmity. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you all witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Now then, I need to help you with these particular passages of Scripture. Starting in... Verse 13, verse 14, and verse 15. It is possible that you may have to go into the annotated portion of your Bible. Not the Scripture part, but the annotated part. That's the, that's the notes that are out to the side. You understand the Scripture is inspired of God. The notes aren't necessary. They are men's opinions. And sometimes they're really good. But it is possible in your, the annotated section of your Bible, it has something to this effect, a note around these three verses of Scripture that say, this is the Apostle Paul referring to his thorn in the flesh. Okay, I want to help you. No, it is not. This is not Paul's thorn. We have looked at Paul's thorn. If you need a refresher, I have a whole teaching on just Paul's thorn in the flesh. Paul's thorn in the flesh was not a physical infirmity. It was a demonic spirit that was sent to attack him, to keep him from preaching the gospel, which is exactly what he said it was. Now then, did, uh, 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 apparently, did Paul have some type of physical infirmity when he first went to Galatia? Yes, he says that he did. He says it was a physical infirmity. Well, I want to ask you this question. I'm a minister. I have been a minister for a long time. There are times that I have to deal with physical infirmities. 
You know, things like the humongous fungus, the bongadugu rash, you know, stuff like that. Things that everybody gets. And so you have challenges like everything else. Well, you don't shut down preaching just because you don't feel good. As a matter of fact, I have to tell you, there are times when I have not, matter of fact, if I'd have been working about any other job, I'd have stayed home. But, you know, very interesting thing happens. Is you come to church, you begin to sing and to praise God in praise and worship. And then as you start come or as I start coming up to preach, I don't ever notice that infirmity anymore. Once I get up and start preaching. And I cannot count the number of times that that, that has happened to me over the years. Like I said, I've been doing this a long time. But it, it, and it, sometimes I have to be careful because as a minister it's easy to just kind of get used to or even take for granted the anointing. But that anointing is real and that anointing is on you. If you're preaching the Word, that anointing is on you every time you teach and preach. And that anointing, that power will drive out infirmity out of your body. And there have been, there have been times, not many, I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, 50 times or something, but, but there have been times, just like you, I mean, you know, you've gotten up some mornings and you thought, dear Lord, I, you know, boy, I feel like somebody beat me with a log chain last night in my sleep. I just, you know, I, you can hardly move and stuff like that. Well, you know, that happens occasionally. But that anointing will, will help get you through that and get that stuff off of you. So the, the Apostle Paul here, as, as much preaching as he did, would there have been some times that he might have felt a little under the weather? That's what we're talking about here. And so we have made uh, we have made this into all kinds of stuff. Matter of fact, we follow this line of thinking in these verses of Scripture. Well, Paul had this physical infirmity, and it was obviously his eyes. And later on, we, we find later on the cha- in, in Galatians, he says, You see with what big letter I wrote you. And people say, well, you see, the Apostle Paul had to write this letter, this, this letter to the Galatians in giant letters because his eyes were bothering him and he couldn't see. That's not, that's not what he was talking about. Matter of fact, I'll go ahead and give you a little bit. I believe, it's my personal opinion, okay? But I usually have a reason for having an opinion. I believe that the book of Galatians and the book of Hebrews were one book, one letter. And I believe that the first part of that letter was sent to these churches in Asia Minor, and the book of Hebrews was was sent to the Jews that had uh, moved there because of the diaspora, the dispersing of the Jews. So they had moved into this area, and so these two letters were sent, the Galatians reminding them of, of the, the accuracy of, of Paul's teaching, and then the book of Hebrews reminding the Hebrew people about the priesthood of Christ and the covenant. And then those two things going together, the book of Hebrews would have certainly helped the Jewish-minded people, and it would have also helped them to leave the Galatians alone with goofy teaching. So it, it's just my opinion, okay? It may, it may not have happened that way at all. But you can understand if you take the book of Galatians and the book of Hebrews and combine them, that is a large letter. That would be a a big letter that that he would have sent. And I think that's what he was talking about. Not, I've got some horrible eye disease and I can can barely see, so I have to write in four-inch letters to, you know, to... I don't think so. But he did, and he said, if it possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. And so... People look at that and they think, well, obviously, he was having problems with his eyes. Well, all right, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever heard this described of somebody? You know that person right there, I tell you what? They're, they are such a kind person, they'll give you the shirt off their back. Y'all ever heard that? 
Well, okay, so how do you how do you spot this person? How do you tell the person they're talking about? Well, he's the one sitting in the audience with no shirt on. Now, that doesn't make sense. It's an expression that you use to describe somebody's willingness to give. He doesn't literally go, in or go around taking, buying shirts and going around and taking them off and handing them people. Right? It's just an expression we use. This is just an expression that the Apostle Paul, you know, I mean, your eyesight is very valuable to you. If you ask most people, if you had to lose one of your senses, <laughs> sight is not the one they would pick. That's the one you'd want to keep. So he's talking about, you would have plucked your eyes out because you're that loving, you're that care, you treated me with that respect and honor of which I am very grateful that you would have plucked your eyes out. It, 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 I mean, he may have had an eye infection. I don't know. But I believe this was an infection. But, but what happens is people make a stretch by saying, this is talking about Paul's thorn in the flesh. It's obvious he had something wrong with his eyes. And I believe that it was ophthalmia. Well, ophthalmia is a horrible eye disease back then that had an infection in the eye that caused a discharge of pus. So their eye would have been red and swollen and pus would have been coming out. Well, that would have really messed up because when you go back and look at the book of Acts and the Apostle Paul is preaching, it would have been during this time. And he, he remember he told, the, he, said, he told the man, he said, look upon me. And the man looking upon Paul received strength in his legs and walked. Okay. So you tell me, there's a man there that's infirm in his legs and he looks up at Paul and Paul's eyes are swollen and red and dripping pus with that inspired faith for the man to get healed. Lord, no. I, I just, no, he wouldn't have. I don't, I don't believe it. He's, he's talking to them here about going back to old world ways of doing things. But he said, and then he brags on them. He tells them, look, you people were a blessing to me. You, you, you treated me with respect. I mean, I wasn't feeling good, and you would have done anything at all possible to have helped me if you could. And I appreciate those so very much from you. Got sidetracked there a little bit, went into more of that than I really needed to, but you understand. Have I therefore become your enemy? So, what has happened that I now have become your enemy? When I was here before, you felt your relationship with me was such that you'd have plucked your eyes out to help me, and now have I become your enemy because I tell the truth? They zealously court you. But for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. They're trying to cut you off and get them to think, you to think the way they do. You know that still happens today. I've shared with you before. I'm sure that I'll share it with you again. The enemy, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goes about seeking whom he may devour. So, apparently, he can't just devour anybody. They have to meet a certain criteria for him to actually be able to attack and to devour them. So, he's looking for those people. And in about three weeks from now, I'm actually preaching a sermon on this, and I'm going to go into detail about what that is. I'm not going to do that today. But my point is this. One of the things that the enemy tries to do to you is divide you. He comes in and brings things, thoughts, or other people that come in and fabricate or tell things that cause, create division. This happens in marriages. The enemy comes in and tries to split the marriage up using this strategy. Another area that he does it in, and this is what Paul is talking about, he will do it with your pastor.
You'll be out talking to somebody. You'll tell them about what it is that you learned in church. Oh, well, wait a minute. That's not right, brother. I mean, I don't want to say this, but your pastor doesn't know what he's talking about. And they'll, they'll come out and they'll, and they'll make something sound really good and really flowery and really fluffy. And they'll, they'll appeal to your ego and it'll start drawing you away. Listen, I want to share something with you. You know, you don't have to agree with everything I say. You don't have to agree with it at all. But one of the things, and, 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 and I, remember, I remember this a long time ago. This would have been all the way back in 1994. I remember uh, uh, a young man coming to our church. Matter of fact, he had, had started coming to church when we first started the church. One of the things that he would tell people is, he said, you know, one of the reasons I like going there is because he doesn't share his opinion. He just shows it to me in the Bible. So, I don't mind. If, if you have a different opinion than I do, that's fine. I don't mind you having a different opinion than I do. But where the Word is concerned, it would be really good not to counter that, not, not to come against that. That part, that, that's why when I preach, I try to use Scripture so much. I, I, my opinion won't do you any good. But the Word will. The Word will cause power to come in your life that will help you walk in victory in your life. And that's what it is that we're trying to do. That's where it is we're trying to get to. So this, the Apostle Paul is describing this happening with these Galatians. There are people that are coming in that are trying to divide those people away from Paul. And he said, what's happened? He said, there was a time that, that you would have done anything for me to help me. And now I've become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth. And, and these people zealously court you. There is a strategy that they are using to try to draw you away. They want to exclude you. That you will go over to their side and be zealous for them. Another way to use that, sometimes people are drawn away because their ears are tickled. They hear something that tickles their ears. One of the things that I have found, and I have seen it happen in our church many, many times, people will, will come and start going to church here because they like the teaching. And they, they hear things, they learn things, they, they see things opened up to them they haven't seen before. But then after a period of time, something starts to happen. And that, the thing that happens, it's, it's an oh no moment. And the oh no moment is, I have some responsibility where this is concerned. This isn't just all God doing this. I'm actually going to have to put this to practice in my life. I'm actually going to have to act on what it is that I believe. Now, every one of you in here have been faced with that at some time. You have chosen wisely. Others haven't. They would rather be somewhere where they can just kind of hide and have their ears tickled and, oh, that was good, that was sweet, we love the Lord, and they just go on and live their life any way they want to live it. And... I, I hate that because they won't operate in the power that's been provided for them. And most of the time when bad things happen, they wind up blaming God for it. And, and I, I, I really hate that. So, the Word has the power. So, he, they're trying to draw them away, trying to, to get them to think that way. But it's good to be zealous in a good thing always and not only when I am present with you. My little children from whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. <clears throat> when he says until Christ is formed in you. Remember um, uh, Philippians 2, I think it's verse 12, verse 13 maybe. that says for you to walk out your salvation in fear and trembling. The, the process of you learning and growing in Christ is in fact a process. Your, the new birth is not. You being born again and accepting you, the price for your sins being paid is not an ongoing process. 
learning what your benefits are and how to walk these things out, that is a process, and that's what he's talking about. He's not saying in Philippians, nor here, that you have to earn or to walk out your salvation in order to earn it. He's talking about you've been given this wonderful, glorious gift. It's going to take you a while to figure out what all this encompasses, what all is available to you. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. (laughs) Now, I'm not sure if he's talking about change his tone to being more stern, or I'm being real stern now and I'd kind of back off a little bit. I, I don't know. You know, sometimes you have the idea of going and talking to somebody and you, 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 you see yourself talking to them very gently and then you get around them and that just doesn't work. <laughs> they just, some people won't receive gentle. Okay. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Now this is really important, this next section which is leading into chapter 5. <clears throat> this next section is really important. And we think we've made the Judaizers mad up to this point. This is going to put them over the edge right here. <clears throat> For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through the promise. Okay, we're talking about uh, uh, Hagar would be the bond woman and her son was Ishmael the free woman would be Sarah and her son was Isaac the son of promise which things are symbolic and she's telling okay this is symbolic the 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 free woman and the bond woman and so lest he leave things to their imagination to figure this out he tells them what he's talking about which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai. Now, they're gonna, if you're talking to a Judaizer, the one from Mount Sinai, they're going to think that's Sarah and Isaac. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Oh, that's it. That, he lost him. Lost him right there. Oh, sweet Lord Jesus. I mean, okay, let me, let, me, let me continue. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is <laughs> Jerusalem. This corresponds to Jerusalem, the one under bondage, the one born of the slave, the bondwoman. Oh, oh my, I, they're having to get the paddles out now. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Now, go ahead to verse 28. Now, we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise, but as he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so uh, now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. This, this is just wiped out, their whole thinking. When he said, in verse 24, this is symbolic, there are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Okay, let's look at this for just a moment in closing this morning. When he said Mount Sinai is of the bondwoman, what did the children of Israel receive on Mount Sinai? The law. All of the law. The law of Moses. The law of the prophets. All of that was received on Mount Sinai. And Paul said, that's the bondwoman. That's bondage. That is what you have been delivered from. 
I, I don't know if you can resuscitate them at this point. They're, they're, they're just, the Judaizers, they've just, they've, they've, they're gone. Now, do you remember over in Genesis what happened with the bondwoman and her son? The bondwoman and her son, Ishmael, Ishmael started, the word is used in, in Genesis is scoffing. He scoffed at Isaac. And Sarah saw him do it and went to Abraham and said, that's not right. Now you understand this whole deal was Sarah's idea to begin with. Okay, Sarah's the one that came up with this plan. Not Abraham, Sarah did. Now Abraham could have said no, but hey, he did. Sarah's the one that came up with the plan. And what happened was, is Ishmael was older and he started acting like the heir when Isaac was born. And he started making fun of him, scoffing him. And Sarah said, that's, uh, that's not going to work. And so over in Genesis, I think it's around chapter 21, maybe chapter 22, the Lord instructs Abraham, He said, send them away. Send them away. Now, you have to understand that Ishmael has been around for years. He, he, he's not five years old. He's a young man. He's a teenager. He, some people estimate that he's, uh, uh, you know, 15, 19 years old. Somewhere. I mean, you can go back and figure the uh, uh, dates on it. But he's not a toddler. And the Lord tells him, send them away. That is Mount Sinai. Paul is saying, get the law out of your presence. Get the law completely out of your life. Now, one of the things that we have to be careful, if we're not careful, we'll do that to ourselves. We'll start making things legalistic and come up with our own version of that. And you can't do that. The thing that, that we base our faith on is the, the Word, obviously, but is the grace, the free gift that's been given to us, which is from above and from the Spirit, not according to the law. And now then, the Apostle Paul really, if you think he hadn't been doing it now, he really begins to shuck the corn and he hits them right between the eyes in chapter 5, and we're going to look at that next week when we pick this back up. Okay? All right. Well, I sure do appreciate you being here today. My desire for you is that God's richest and best are yours. And remember, there's victory in Jesus. Amen. As I tithe and give offerings, I'm believing the Lord for vision and direction, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increased. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs, that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you agree with that, say, Amen.